As you think over your speech, yes. what is the key point you want people to remember from it? I think the, the one thing that I really leaned into was, <laughs> was not staying in your lane, challenging yourself to try something different. And I actually said at the end of my keynote, I sort of gave a little challenge to the audience. And I said, I want, I want you to think about one thing that you have wanted to do, but haven't, or that you're scared of doing, something that, that, that has been on the list. Because I know for me, like doing video was on the list. I, I had it on there, I just never got around to it. And you know what? If it works, great. If it doesn't work, great. Because then you don't have to do it again. You know that it doesn't fit. But if you try something for the first time and you like it or it resonates with you, then you can explore that. And if it doesn't, that's, that's fine too. But you just got to give it a try. And so I think, I think from my address, that would, be, that would be the main point that I wanted to get across. Simon, you were a keynote speaker today here at NAB. What was the purpose of your talk? I was indeed. So I had the stage talking about how to elevate your commercial photography, but also addressing photographers who are looking to step into the world of motion, which is a journey that I've been on over the past, uh, coming up two years now. How do you elevate your photography? I've been doing this in New York for 16 years now. So I moved here from Sydney, Australia to move my career forward. And of course, the perfect place to do it was, you know, an island with 50,000 other photographers. I mean, that just <laughs> makes sense, right? Uh, and so, you know, I started off talking a lot about my experience in the early days and how I built up the career that I have now, my client base that I have now, uh, touch points that I think are really important in terms of branching outside of what's comfortable, uh, looking outside of a, one particular genre and exploring different avenues for your photography, building your network and how to sort of build a, a base of clients in a really authentic and genuine way. Uh, and then looking, looking outside what maybe you were expecting at other opportunities and other possibilities. Because I know, you know, it, especially back in the day, it was always this expectation to stay in your lane, right? So if you're a fashion photographer, you're a fashion photographer. If you did food, you're a food photographer or architecture, and that was, that was kind of it. And I've always sort of rallied against that idea because, I mean, for one, I uh, get bored very quickly, and so I want to keep on challenging myself. And the way that I found that was to look outside of what really launched my career, which was shooting luxury retail for clients. So I started shooting for Ralph Lauren, John Vervedos, um, and built up a, a really large roster of very important clients and brands. And it was terrific. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the work. Um, but I wanted to look outside of that and see what was possible um, to kind of move the needle forward. Because I think as creatives, we have to keep pushing keep challenging ourselves. Uh, and so I stepped into different genres. I started shooting for, for hotels and hospitality, doing food and beverage. Um, but wait a minute, hold it a second. You're a successful fashion photographer. Not fashion. I, I work in uh, so a lot of luxury retail, hospitality, food and beverage. Fashion was the one. I work for fashion companies, um, but representing their spaces, their experiences. So you're working with, within the genre of fashion, mm -hmm. maybe not fashion models, but within the genre of fashion. And now you say, I'm not a still photographer anymore, I'm a videographer. And not only am I a videographer that I've never done before, but I'm a videographer in a field I've never been in before. How do you convince people that you have a clue what you're doing? Yeah, so I mean, it's a very interesting question. I certainly haven't put, apart, put aside the photography part. That's still a very massive part of my practice. Um, it was a chance encounter that got me into the world of motion. I had a client reach out, a new client, who I really wanted to work with. And they had seen my work, and they said, we love it, we love the way that you see things, and we want that for us, um, but, but we want it moving. 
we want to do video. And you know, I got, I got this, I got this email, and I, I started off so excited at the top of the email, and by the time I got it to the bottom, I was like, oh, <laughs> okay, all right. And you know, I'd been asked over the years, do you do video? Do do you do this, that, and the other thing? Um, and I've always said no. But this opportunity came about. I was like, I'm not going to now. I'm going to figure out how to make this work. And you know, that was like a big aha moment, right? That this was something that was possible if I found people who possessed the technical skills and knowledge that I didn't have and brought them in on this project. And it would still be done. I was going to be directing it. So it was going to be my eye on everything, the way that I light things, the way that I um, structure shots. But I didn't have to be the one that was operating the camera. There are people out there who are way more skilled and talented at that than I will ever be. And I realized it's OK to ask for help. It's OK to bring people in on a project. And at the end of the day, the client knew that I didn't do video. They didn't ask for a sizzle reel. They didn't ask for any of that. They, they liked my aesthetic, and they wanted that, and wanted it in video. But that's really important, mm -hmm. is that you felt that you didn't have to do it all yourself. Right. You felt that you could be part of a team and lead the team to mm -hmm. deliver the vision. Absolutely. But it wasn't that I had to be everything. Yeah. Yeah. And I think at a certain point, if, if you want to grow, there's only so much that you can grow alone. You can go far. I mean, you can achieve amazing things by yourself. But when you open yourself up to the possibilities of what, el what else is out there, and when you ask people for help, when you look outside yourself, it's incredible how much more your world can grow. And it's a really beautiful thing because we can't do it all. And there are so many specialists in so many different areas and especially when it comes to video, I mean, you know, you look at video production teams, it's, it's not one person. You know, there's, there's a, a whole world of people who are really talented at all these different aspects. And yeah, it was, a big, it was a big step forward for me and a big moment to realize that calling on the expertise of other people can help grow my practice, grow me as a creative, and open up a whole new world of possibilities. Well, let's get back to those 15,000 photographers in an island somewhere. Mm -hmm. I think it was 50, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of the big challenges that we face as media creators is the pressure of the budget. Mm -hmm. And as you know, budgets are not the same as they were yeah. five or even 10 years ago. How do you convince people that you're worth the money and, more importantly, even if you're worth the money, that you're so much better than somebody that would do it for half the price. Yeah. How do you fight that pricing pressure? And I think, I think this is a challenge that is faced by so many creative industries. We have the same in, in photography. And I personally, it is my least liked aspect of the job. And I don't think there's anyone out there who's like, oh, can't wait to put together an estimate. <laughs> you know, no one's jumping for joy at that. Um, and so it is a struggle. I think that the, the key points of trying to position yourself are firstly recognizing your value and working out what that means for you. And everyone has a different metric for what that means. You know, maybe you're basing your value off 50 years worth of experience and you think that that is achievable, you know, that, that falls in that kind of budget. Or maybe you're just starting out and you're like, well, you know, I'm starting at the ground up and that's going to dictate the way you price things out. Um, for me, I look, at, uh, I look at things holistically, like what is it going to achieve? Like wh what's it going to take to achieve this project? What do I need to pull it in so it's reasonable for the client, but it satisfies all of my needs? Um, and also, something that I've started doing more and more now, and at first I was a little reticent to do it, and I've now got to the point where I just don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and it's scary, is I have a very open conversation with my clients and I say, look, I don't want to spend weeks going back and forward on what the money is and where the money's going. So if you want me in this project, you know, and this is if I'm working with a new client or whatever, I'm like, let's have an open conversation about what your expectations are. You know, I don't need you to give me a 
dollar figure of where you need this to hit if you want to, then fine. And we'll like see what's possible within that range. But let's find out what your expectations are. I'll let you know what's possible with that. But if I don't think that that's going to achieve this project the way that I want to represent it, I will let you know that it's going to be you know, X amount more to pull together the project to satisfy you and to give a quality project at the end. Because I'm, I'm not going to compromise the project because of money. If it's not achievable, if the client doesn't have it, it's OK. Maybe the next time they will, but on this particular one, they won't. But you said something I want to push back on a little yeah. bit. You said if a project is, uh, meets the client's standards and meets your own standards, right. aren't your own standards irrelevant no. if you keep the client happy? No. No, not for me. Not How for come? me. Because if I'm putting, obviously the, the, the top line is your client, what they need and what's, what's going to make them happy. But if it isn't a project that I would feel um, happy about having ownership of, if it was so far out of the realms of what I would proudly show, I just don't think it's a project that I would want to be on. And that's a, that's a personal choice. I'm very grateful in that I have amazing clients. I get to work on really beautiful things. Um, but should something come along and it just doesn't fit what I would want to put out there as my work, I just don't think it's a project that I would take. And you know, I know that that's, that's kind of um, like a fortunate position to be in because I don't feel like I have to take every single project that comes along. And like I said, if, if the client comes in and they're like, well, this is our budget, I'm like, we can't make it work for this, it's okay. Because maybe down the line, something will come up that fits and we can work together. And that's, and that's great. Um, but I think there's, there's something to be said about, about you know, creating wood, work that you're proud of. And yes, we get to do it with our clients so they're happy and proud of it as well. Um, but it's a kind of a collaboration for me. It's a collaborative effort. As you think over your speech, yes. what is the key point you want people to remember from it? I think the, the one thing that I really leaned into was, <laughs> was not staying in your lane, challenging yourself to try something different. And I actually said at the end of my keynote, I sort of gave a little challenge to the audience. And I said, I want, I want you to think about one thing that you have wanted to do, but haven't, or that you're scared of doing. Something that, that, that has been on the list. Because I know for me, like, doing video was on the list. I, I had it on there, I just never got around to it. And you know what? If it works, great. If it doesn't work, great. <laughs> Because then you don't have to do it again. You know that it doesn't fit. But if you try something f for the first time and you like it or it resonates with you, then you can explore that. And if it doesn't, that's, that's fine too. But you just got to give it a try. And so I think, I think from my address, that would, be, that would be the main point that I wanted to get across. Just go out there and try something. Try it once. That's it. Figure, figure the rest out. 